Hello, today we're going to talk about structure 3.1.4 and 3.1.5, which has to do with the trends in properties in groups, particularly metallic character of group 1 and non-metallic character of group 17. We should also know that metallic and non-metallic properties are showing some kind of continuum, and we're going to look specifically at the um, oxides, um, metal oxides and non-metal oxides. Okay, so um, just a quick review uh, on the periodic table. You guys should know that there is kind of a continuum between metallic and non-metallic substances or elements. Um, and then there's like this staircase here. And right along the staircase are those elements that are metalloids. Um, and to the left are metals, to the right are non-metals. But essentially, you're, you have this continuum of more metallic character to the left and less metallic character to the right, um, for the most part. It might be worth your time going back and reviewing um, the bonding triangle. Um, I want to say it was section 2.4. So that way you get an idea of um, how those elements and their electronegativities are influencing the types of bonds they form based on their metallic versus non-metallic uh, character. So let's talk about the group one metals, the alkali metals. Um, so it starts with hydrogen, but hydrogen can be classified as either a metal or a non-metal, depending on what's going on. Um, and then you, know, you have lithium and et cetera. Essentially, as you're going down group one, um, your ionization energy is decreasing. So up here, you're going to have the highest ionization energies. And down at the bottom of the group, you'll have the lowest ionization energies. And remember, ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from the atom. And metals really want to lose their electrons. So the Elements that have a low ionization energy are really good at losing their electrons, and they're more metallic in character. And the ones with high ionization energies, it's going to be harder to remove their electrons, so they are going to be less metallic in character. Now, group 17 are the halogens. Uh, starting with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and then it keeps going, um, acetine and tennessine. But for the most part, we deal with these four. Um, now, fluorine is going to have the highest um, electronegativity of the group, and so it's going to have the strongest electron affinity as well. Okay, so fluorine is going to attract electrons to it the best. And as you go down the group, it um, becomes a little bit more difficult for the atoms to attract electrons to it. Now, non-metals, because halogens are non-metals, they want to attract electrons to it. So the most non-metal ones, non-metallic, are going to be at the top of the group, and the least non-metallic is going to be at the bottom of the group. Um, and again, that's because the further up on the periodic table, the more likely it's going to attract electrons because the nucleus is not that far away from the valence shell. The further away the nucleus is from the valence shell, the harder it is to attract electrons to it. And so that's the trend for non-metallic character. All right, so you need to make sure that you know some different reactions for the alkali metals. Um, so you need to know how they react with water. Um, for example, if I have a lithium, lithium reacts with water. Um, a little bit more slowly than some of the other alkali metals. Um, as you go down the group, remember they become more metallic in character, so they're going to react more strongly with water. Um, and it's going to react, there'll be two waters. When it reacts, it's going to form lithium hydroxide, but that is a strong base, so that's going to completely dissociate into lithium ions and hydroxide ions. You're also going to release hydrogen gas. This is aqueous, liquid, solid. 
So that's the pattern for how alkali metals react with water. Um, you should also know how the alkali metals react with halogens. So for example, if I have lithium, again, solid, reacting with, let's say, iodine, um, which is also a solid at room temperature, um, it's going to form an ionic compound, and it will form lithium iodide. And depending on the temperature, it might be solid, or you could do it in water if you wanted to, make an aqueous solution. But the, that's the pattern of reactivity for the alkali metals. You also need to know how um, halogens react with each other. I'm going to go ahead and write the order of the first couple as, again, um, fluorine, oops, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And fluorine is going to be the most reactive of this group, and iodine is going to be the least reactive. Um, I'm just abbreviating reactive. So this matters because halogens will do um, effectively a single replacement reaction. So let's say I have something like um, chlorine by itself. Um, which is a gas at room temperature. And let's say I'm going to react with, let's say, sodium bromide, and we'll make it aqueous sodium bromide. The element that's by itself has to be higher up in the group than the element that's in the compound, and that's called an activity series. So in order for it to react, the element by itself has to be higher up on the periodic table than the element that's in the compound. And since chlorine is higher than bromine, more reactive than bromine, it will replace and form. Um, it'll uh, release the bromine by itself, um, which is typically a liquid at room temperature. And then we will have our sodium chloride being formed. Now that is not the net ionic equation. Um, the sodium would be a spectator ion. So our net ionic equation would look like this. Uh, and we would remove the um, two sodium ions from both sides and have your um, halogen ions, your halide ions. And so that's your pattern of reactivity. You just need to make sure the element by itself is more reactive than the element in the compound. Okay, so let's review really quick kind of the bonding um, as you go across the periodic table. So if I'm starting at the left-hand side um, with maybe something like sodium oxide, uh, the next one over would be magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide, and then you'd have things like um, phosphorus, uh, P4O10, and uh, sulfur di trioxide or dioxide, either one. Um, so th those are some of the oxides of the third period elements. Now, these ones on the left are going to be those the metal oxides and have an ionic bond. These ones on the right are going to be um, covalently bound. Those are those, and these really are non-metal oxides. Aluminum is kind of weird because it's in the it's in the middle. It's very close to being a uh, metalloid, um, so that one is going to behave kind of in the middle. Um, of the two. And so the metal oxides uh, will be basic in water. The non-metal oxides will be acidic in water. And things like aluminum, metalloids, um, are very close to metalloids, will be amphoteric. And remember, amphoteric means that it can act as either an acid or a base, depending on the scenario. Um, and that's, of course, in water. You have to have a water solution of the oxides in order to have a pH that's measurable. Okay, so you definitely need to know how um, all of the oxides will react with water. Um, let's start with metal oxides, so things like sodium oxide or magnesium oxide. In water, they are going to act as bases, so they will produce a hydroxide. In this case, we're making um, sodium hydroxide, and in this case, we're making magnesium hydroxide. So those group one, remember, will just 
pair with one hydroxide. Group two will pair with two hydroxides. Um, now these are not net ionic equations, um, so you'll need to <clears throat> pay attention to whether your bases that are being formed are strong bases or weak bases. Um, so sodium hydroxide is a strong base, so this would split up into two sodium and two hydroxide ions. Whereas the magnesium hydroxide one is not going to be split apart, it only partially ionizes in solution. Now you should also know how nonmetal oxides react with water. So I'm going to show you a couple examples here. If I have SO3, SO2, and CO2, um, these are nonmetal oxides, so they're going to form acidic solutions. And they're going to form acids. So this one will form um, H2SO4 sulfuric acid, which is a strong acid. Um, this one will form H2SO3, which is a weak acid. And um, the carbon dioxide will react to form carbonic acid, which again is a weak acid. Um, so again, just make sure you know the difference between how metal oxides react and non-metal oxides react. Okay, so those non-metal oxide reactions are um, really important for us to know about because of um, two major applications, acid rain and then ocean acidification. There are certain pollutants that will increase the amount of SO2 or SO3 in the atmosphere. And those are gases. Um, so things like um, industrial byproducts can release sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide. And when it reacts with water in the air, it's going to form acids, H2SO3 and H2SO4. And those things contribute to um, the pH of uh, rainwater because of that, those reactions that are happening in the atmosphere. And so it's going to decrease, lower the pH of rainwater, making acid rain. There are a few other sources of those pollutions, um, like um, nitrogen dioxide is one of them. Uh, but just kind of keep an, keep an idea that those non-metal oxides will produce the acids, and that is a problem for acid rain. Um, ocean acidification is also an issue, um, and that one particularly, you should know, um, has to do with CO2 levels. So as the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are increasing, it's also increasing the amount of carbon dioxide that's dissolved in ocean water. And um, when carbon dioxide reacts with water, that forms carbonic acid. And um, this in turn lowers the pH of the ocean, ocean water, which can be problematic, especially for ecosystems like coral reefs, um, where increasing acid will actually break down the structure of coral or certain types of shells. Um, certain organisms will just have, will have a lot of trouble in more acidic environments. Um, so those are kind of your two applications of this in the real world. So let's look at a few examples from this. Um, state the equation describing the reaction between cesium and water. Cesium and water. Cesium is an alkali metal. Um, so it reacts, it's going to form cesium hydroxide and um, hydrogen gas. Um, and you can go ahead and split that's a solid liquid. You can go ahead and split the cesium when we should balance, of course. The two cesium ions and the two hydroxide ions. And we have our hydrogen gas emitted as well. So there is our reaction with the alkali metal and water. Here's another example from this chapter on um, why chlorine is more reactive than iodine. So chlorine is further up on the periodic table, but that doesn't tell us why. Um, the better reason has to do with its electron affinity. Chlorine has a stronger electron affinity than iodine, and that's because it has fewer energy levels. Iodine has more energy levels. So that means that chlorine's nucleus, the protons, can exert a greater attraction to outside electrons um, compared with iodine, which has you know, a greater distance between the nucleus and outside electrons. Um, so that is why chlorine is more reactive, because it has um, that stronger electron affinity. 
So chlorine seven oxide of uh, Cl2O7 reacts violently with water, right? A balanced chemical equation for this reaction. So you should notice that this is a non-metal oxide, so it's going to definitely form an acid. Um, so here we've got Cl2O7. We assume it's a solid, reacts with water. It's going to form an acid. Um, in this case, because we've got the two chlorines, I can actually make um, two of the acids here. So two of my HClO4s, and that will balance it out because I have two hydrogens, two chlorines, and then eight oxygens altogether. Um, and that is uh, perchloric acid, which is a strong acid. Um, so then I could also um, go ahead and write the net ionic equation for this by splitting up the hydrogen ions, two hydrogen ions and two of the perchlorate ions like this. But um, always remember those non-metal oxides are forming acids. Okay, so this links back to um, some of our inquiry and our scientific tools, skills, um, why are simulations often used when we're exploring the trends in chemical reactivity for group one and group 17. Um, so simulations are used a lot because, um, especially when you get into those larger alkali metals, it can be very dangerous to do reactions with them. Um, they react violently with water. They produce a lot of energy. They're, they're almost explosive at that point, really. Um, so it becomes very dangerous to use them in the lab. Um, same thing with some of the group 17 elements. They could be like noxious gases um, or just difficult to work with, some of the group 17 ones. So um, simulations are useful to explore the reactivity without um, the safety issues. Okay, and then we need to link this back to um, some of our chemical structure bonding. Uh, and how do the differences in bonding explain the differences in properties for metal and non-metal oxides? And so remember that metal oxides like Na2O are going to have ionic bonding, whereas our non-metal oxides like let's say SO2 is going to pretty much exhibit covalent bonding. And so when this reacts with water, our, um, the water can also behave somewhat like an ionic compound where the hydrogen and the hydroxide are going to split and you're going to be able to um, react the sodium ions with the hydroxide and then you can form another hyd hydroxide and attach to another sodium. And so that ionic bond with the uh, attractions between the positive and negative ions helps us to form that base. Um, covalent structures are going to be, behave a little bit differently. Um, and that's why you're going to wind up with um, acids being formed because the attractions of the nonmetal to the oxygen are, are much stronger.